Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And also by the generous support of listeners like you, who choose to support us at Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the stone was Mazarin, the carbuncle was blue, and the mane was lion, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about what kind of chemistry experiments Sherlock Holmes was running? Or what a Yegman is? Or why Holmes' index was sorted haphazardly? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 314, Mentors in the Canon. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, are you ready to be a mentor to thousands of, well, maybe tens of young listeners out there? I thought it was mentors. I thought we were going to be talking about counterfeiting. Oh, well, I mean, if you want to print out some money and send it my way, <laughs> I have no objections there. I will, but, you know, I've, it takes me so long with the colored pencils to do an authentic $5 bill that maybe I should just forget about it. <laughs> That's great. You know, that reminds me of um, a scene in The Great Escape. You ever see that movie? Yes, yeah, sure. McQueen. Uh, and one of, the, one of the skill sets they found inside the camp there was the, uh, the forger. And uh, just how wonderful he did with the the money and the passports and all the papers that were needed. Oh, right, right. So I think that was Donald Pleasance that played that role, and then he was going blind by um, by the time of the escape. So mm. you know his his skill set was being rendered useless. Mm. But and I suppose this is a, a perfect segue into uh, talking about mentors. You know this this season. This is the first episode of season seven here on Trifles. First episode of 2023, and we are uh, establishing a new monthly theme this year, in addition to other themes that you will hear pop up. Uh, and every month we will acknowledge uh, some uh, national uh, celebration. You know, th- you know, there are you know, like National Hamburger Month, National Ice Cream Month, etc. Um, so we have a list of uh, monthly celebrations, and we're going to pick them. And and just so you know, the the place that we the source that we get our information from for these months is uh, eventguide.com. And just to give you an idea, for January alone, there are 82 observances and awareness events for the month according to eventguide.com. Uh this this is also National Meat Month. National Soup Month. <clears throat> now, when you say National Meat Month, how, yes. how do you spell the word meat? Well, how do you think it's spelled? Well, clearly, uh, M-E-E-T. It's, it's gatherings and, and uh, welcoming each other and meeting friends. Well, when we do that, we ought to do it over a steak because it's <laughs> M-E-A-T. <laughs> oh, oh. Um, so anyway, there are plenty of things to choose from. And what we've tried to do in each of these 12 months is to pick something that um, obviously is related to the Sherlock Holmes canon. We, we wanted to give ourselves a discussion point and then go through the stories and see if we could match some details up to, uh, to match that particular uh, monthly observance. So uh, we'll start out with mentors. The show notes for this episode, including a link to uh, that event guide site and um, other mentoring facilities, uh, are available at ihose.co slash trifles314, all lowercase. That'll take you directly to the show notes for 
uh, this episode on Sherlock Holmes podcast.com. You can also just check the show notes in whatever podcasting app that you're using. And while you're in that app, if you wouldn't mind giving us a rating or review, that would uh, help other people find the show. And uh, you can tell them why you find it so interesting. And uh, don't just stick to ratings and reviews. I mean, share it out on newsletters and uh, social media sites and email and all the rest. We like as many Sherlockians as we can to discover this show and the wonder that it is all about. Um, and also on our website, you can find a link to our Patreon page. We are patreon.com slash trifles for as little as a dollar a month. You can help support the show. We have some thank you gifts and we put out exclusive content from time to time just for our patrons. And before I forget, Bert, holy crap, one of the benefits of being a patron is you are automatically eligible for a monthly and quarterly drawing that we do. Um, the monthly drawing is for a free back issue of the Baker Street Journal, and the quarterly drawing is for an annual subscription to the Baker Street Journal. And we were informed <laughs> that in our final episode of season six, we forgot to to hold the drawing. So we're going to do it right now. Uh, so I guess uh, we have to, uh, from our iHose studios, our I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere podcast studios, we have to wheel over the big prize wheel. It's uh, it's pretty heavy, so we're getting it over here. And uh, now that it's here, we're going to reach over and give it a big spin. <laughs> This prize wheel is simply a fancy version of a uh, random number generator. And this is for uh, our first drawing for a, um, a back issue of the Baker Street Journal. And it looks like it has landed on number 39. And uh, number 39 is Bill Singos. Bill, my friend from back at the Speckled Band of Boston. Thank you very much for... Uh, being a supporter, you have a uh, a back issue of the Baker Street Journal coming your way. And now, for the annual subscription to the Baker Street Journal, let's spin it again. All right. Landing on number 47. 47. And that looks like it is our friend, John Witcher. John, congratulations. You have earned yourself an annual subscription to the Baker Street Journal. Um, and if there are any discrepancies here, if we have drawn names twice for some reason, if we've given people a subscription that they already have, well, we'll take it up with you offline and make arrangements. So, now, let's get on with the show, shall we? So we're going to talk about mentors in the canon and ju just the whole concept of mentoring. Um, Bert, have you ever have you ever been a mentor? Have you ever been mentored? Yes, I would say professionally, sure. I I uh, certainly had been mentored. I had um, I spent a good deal of my career at AT and T, and the head of oh, public relations and advertising, you know, was a very uh, powerful mentor for me and I learned a lot from you know and she she made it her business actually just to spend some time with me and to share experiences from her life that I found you know really useful putting those principles into practice and over mm. the years I've had people that I've worked closely with that I've been in um, a mentoring kind of capacity I like that and that's that's just the thing there are formal and informal mentoring processes. I think most of us are on the receiving end of uh, informal ones, and I would hope that many of us are on the giving end as well. You know, as we grow in experience and in uh, outlook, we have a whole generation of people coming up after us. And I've always been taught that the most important job of leaders is to train the next generation of leaders coming up. 
um, basically to find your replacements. And in doing so, it doesn't necessarily need to be a formal program in place, but sharing your experiences and uh, helping people to understand what to avoid, what mistakes to try uh, to avoid that you've made. that You'd like to see them kind of walk around rather than go through. Uh, and of course, as we all know, life uh requires us to make mistakes sometimes so you know if you've got a mentor that's trying to help you avoid mistakes uh, sometimes one of the best things they can do is actually put you into a situation where you need to actually extract yourself from it and uh, and learn that way as well Hmm. so um uh, this is this is going to be interesting because i know we have some mentor examples and we have some anti-mentor examples uh in the story so where would you like to begin well, I think, you know, to your point, the issue of mentoring, you know, when you're thinking about mentoring, you're thinking about trusted authority figures who, as we've just said, take it upon themselves to show the way, to make the the journey up of people who are subordinate to them or people for whom they have a responsibility, for them they they work to make those people's journeys and experiences easier and uh, share their experiences and so on but sadly in the world of sherlock holmes many of the most trusted authority figures that we see are flawed people you know you have mm. people who are responsible for retaining governesses to instruct their children for whom they have quite a responsibility and um, their own behaviors in in the person of Neil Gibson and in the person of uh, uh, you know um, Jeffro Rucastle and other examples uh, are, are I would say f- They've missed the opportunity <laughs> yeah. to be to be mentors and protectors and helpful. Yeah, shall we say? Yeah, I mean, I, I, governesses themselves, although they are hired help, they are mentors of uh, of a type. And you know, there there are these uh, these governesses like uh, Violet uh, Hunter, and um, uh, who is who is the governess in um, uh, the Thor Bridge? Um, it was Neil Gibson, and it was Miss... Thorbridge, Grace Dunbar, Grace Dunbar. Grace Dunbar, of course. Um, Grace Dunbar. And See, we Flat. have forgotten Grace Dunbar much more quickly than Neil Gibson. Yes, well, you couldn't forget her. That was the problem. She was obsessive. Um, but these, these governesses, Violet Hunter, Grace Dunbar, they are responsible for the forming of the minds of these young children. And at the same time, they were on questionable terms with their employers, shall we say, Uh, employers that had been pressuring them in one way or another, uh, that, as you say, Bert, is almost the anti-mentorship kind of relationship. Now, of course, when you think about these kinds of relationships, it's not too long before you think about the relationship between Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And Holmes, I suppose, is something of a, of a mentor to Watson in that he's, uh, with some exasperation, occasionally uh, instructing Watson about techniques of observation and inference. But, um, you know, Holmes also is, is, uh, has been known to be dismissive of Watson. I, th- I think that's a characteristic that isn't found among the really great mentors. Mm. But, but then once you think about that relationship, you also have to think about Mycroft and Sherlock Holmes, because Mycroft was Holmes's senior by seven years. Mm. And you have to wonder, gee, I wonder to what degree Mycroft was a good mentor to Sherlock Holmes. And he well may have been. I mean, they do seem to be comfortable with each other uh, in the few instances we see them working together. And of course, Mycroft is of huge help to Holmes in the final problem and so on. But, um, uh, well, you know, I, I have to question the notion of mentorship between the two brothers, because from what we've seen, certainly in that introductory uh, scene with Mycroft, between the two brothers, it seems more competitive than collaborative, mm. if uh, you had to ask me. They were, they were trying to do 
a game of one-upsmanship uh, rather than, well, I suppose when, when we get to the end of it, uh, you know, they, they explain, Mycroft explains why he came to a certain conclusion. So he's helping Sherlock along in that way. Mm. But uh, you, you certainly don't get the sense of a warm, nurturing mentorship between the two, do you? No, but on the other hand, it would be hard to have someone like Mycroft seven years your senior. So let's say, you mm. know, you're four years old and your brother is 11. It would be hard not to be learning from his experiences in the world, particularly when you both share these natural gifts. Well, sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the notion that uh, a, a junior, you know, seven years younger, I mean, they, they hold their siblings on a pedestal. Um, well, until they're in their teen years, and then they hold everyone in disdain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not speaking from experience. No. I just want to be clear. No, not you. No, 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 no. <laughs> Well, speaking of disdain, I think it's time we took a quick break and uh, heard from our sponsor. You know, Bert, how many years have you been subscribing to the Baker Street Journal? Uh, well... <laughs> Certainly, uh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just doing the, I'm just doing the. I can hear pretty, the abacus clacking from over here. I'm pretty. It's, it's certainly over forty years. And wow, that's amazing. Well, uh, I've been subscribing probably for a good thirty years myself, um, and and when you look at the entirety of the Baker Street Journal, it's been going strong almost consistently since 1946. There was a little gap there in the late 1940s, early 50s, uh, but that was shorn up pretty quickly and it's been going like gangbusters ever since. Uh, we get quarterly, ep uh, quarterly episodes, quarterly uh, issues of the journal and it's filled with uh, wonderful perspectives. And you know, it, it, I think Sherlockian scholarship is cyclical. I mean, we get in certain ruts. We see the same old, same old from time to time. But I don't know if you've noticed this, Bert, that the, the variety and the quality of essays and articles and analyses in the Baker Street Journal in recent years has just been uh, phenomenal. Mm. It has been. You know, and I was just thinking of the last issue, um, you know, which is really first rate. There was this massive... Um, article there by our friend Ira Matetsky, who had dug into the records of Harper Brothers, the publishing company at mm. uh, Columbia University, and found out some fascinating things about the way the stories came to light, came to be published, were dealt with in the United States. And there was a, also a lovely article there about neckties. I think that was by Sonia. Was it, did Sonia do that? Uh can't remember who did that. I'll have to go back and check that. It'll be my reading material on the plane, I think, on the way to <laughs> New York City for the BSI weekend. Well, uh, regardless of uh, us not being able to remember the specifics, uh, the general uh, impression that the BSJ gives is one of erudition, scholarship, and fun. And uh, you can take part in that as well. Just go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and take out your subscription for a Baker Street Journal today. Okay, let's let's talk some more about mentors in the canon. We we talked about Mycroft uh, and uh, Sherlock. We talked about the anti-mentors. Um, Let's talk about the men on the tours. No, wait, that's that's men, different. Oh, the men tours. That's pretty uh, clever. Like yeah, that. the um, let, let, let's pull out some examples of people that were uh, either uh, employing apprentices or uh, were working hand in hand in terms of uh, maybe not a formal training program, but we're bringing the next generation along. Um, and what better place to start? Uh, right at the beginning, in um, a study in Scarlet, we had Holmes uh, kind of interacting with these two uh, Scotland Yard detectives, Inspector Lestrade and Inspector Gregson. Mm. He called them the pick of a bad lot. <laughs> and I think that was his, maybe his way of, uh, of saying that they had potential. 
and and he was he was only too glad to help them. And I suppose part of this willingness to help was for his own gratification, right? To continue to hone his own skills. But perhaps, perhaps it was to help these two along in their careers as well. Well, I think that's a very nice interpretation. Um, you know, you do certainly get the sense that um, someone with the ability to see so acutely and to observe so many details and to draw conclusions by his, you know, very nature was never reticent to explain his thinking process and, and what he drew from it. And indeed, in a study in Scarlet, you know, he immediately just sort of cuts to the chase and delivers uh, four or five very salient clues back to, uh, I believe it's Lestrade at, at Lauriston Gardens. Um, but, um, and, it, and two is the relationship warms over the, over the years between Holmes and Lestrade. You know, I think you do get a sense that there's increased comfort between them and that Lestrade is more um, comfortable just sort of dropping in on Holmes and seeing what he can pick up. Yeah, absolutely. And you think you think back to that uh, that final scene in uh, what is it, the Six Napoleons, mm, where uh, yes. he said, uh, "You know, I've seen you handle a good many cases, um, and and we're not jealous of you down at Scotland Yard. We're we're proud of you. And if you come down tomorrow, there's not a a, a single man from the oldest uh, inspector to the youngest constable, constable who wouldn't be." Uh, glad to shake you by the hand, mm. you know, and I think that that level of appreciation uh, acknowledges that mentorship that's happened over the years. Yeah, good example. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, to our prior point about people who are in positions of mentorship but fail, you know, you tend to think about people like Colonel Barkley, who should in um, the case of the crooked man have been looking after the people for whom he was responsible, his, his comrades and subordinates, and failed. And you have people like the Duke of Holderness, who uh, seems to have missed the opportunity to be a reasonable mentor to his uh, his closest associates. Yeah, and that I mean that that is such a um, that that story. While it's it's short and does not have a lot of detail, it's so rich in psychology. Uh, just to think about what happened, the notion of revenge uh, or, or avenging a, uh, a wrong mm. um, is really astounding. Mm. Um, well, and you've got Lord Holdhurst, you know, he's the uncle of oh, Percy yeah. Phelps in, in the Naval Treaty. Yeah. And Holmes, Holmes does say, I think he tells us somewhere in that case, you know, he's a fine fellow, but he has a struggle to keep up his position. And so, um, you know, clearly Holdhurst is, uh, you know, in, in the direction of a mentor to um, Percy Phelps, even if it's, he might not be doing it very successfully. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's of a generation, too, that uh, <laughs> probably did not take kindly to uh, the warm and fuzzy kind of thing that we think about when we think about mentorship, about uh, empathy and uh, you know, bringing along the next generation. It was, you know, pull pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Get with it, man, you know. <laughs> um, similarly, while we're on the topic of nepotism, um, the Cunninghams from uh, the Regate Squires. Uh, this is an interesting one. Father and son who worked uh, together to, uh, to try to... Um, well, what was I? Gosh, I haven't read the Regate Squires in years. Not one of my favorite stories. What was their aim? No, they killed William the Coachman. But what was going on? Were they trying to steal something? Uh, I don't recall what was behind that murder. Well, whatever it was, uh, <laughs> the, the two of them were, uh, you know, working together, father and son. And I would imagine that the old man was was probably the brains of the outfit. Um, and uh, he coached his son on how to actually piece it together uh, to uh, throw the police off the scent. 
Well, yeah, they weren't very they weren't very uh, effective. You know, the the issue about the the, Re- the Reigate Squires is that there were supposedly some thieves in the area. Yeah, and that um, you've got Colonel. Oh, that's the one where <clears throat> they're they're staying with Watson's old friend Colonel Hader, and all of a sudden they learn there's a there's a murder um, me, uh, nearby. But I think it was um, there was some sort of property issue and lawsuits and things going on. Oh, that's and, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a lawsuit going on between. Uh, uh, Hader and Acton and the Cunninghams, and uh, and they had broken in the li- into the library to get the legal documentation, and they tried to cover it up by making it seem like it was uh, the uh, the crime of some of these robbers that were in the the area. Mm. So, burglars. and you know, throughout the canon, you know, you've got these. Um, father and son, these broken father and son relationships where the father, you know, people like uh, James Trevor have um, mm. deep secrets about their early years yeah. that no one knows about and sort of gets in the way of the way they should be bringing yeah, the next McCarthy's generation. McCarthy's are like that in the, the Boscombe yeah. Valley mystery, yeah. Mm. Oh. So I don't uh, know that there are many great examples of terrific well, mentors. Of course, there's know, Wiggins in the Baker Street Irregulars. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good one, yeah. Holmes and, and the whole irregulars. I mean, he was he was training them with useless, not use useful <laughs> street skills. Um, you know, taking their natural habitat and turning it to their benefit. Um, and and if they were if they had their wits about them, they actually could have made a nice little franchise out of it. <laughs> Sold their services to Scotland Yard. Mm. Um, so that that works. And, you know, speaking of, of uh, father and son, uh, broken relationships, et cetera, there's one that uh, there is a deceased father and a father figure steps in to kind of act as mentor. And that is in The Three Students, uh, where you've got uh, Gilchrist, whose father has passed, and Soames, who is the uh, manservant for... Uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 tutor there, hmm. um, <laughs> I guess that makes Gilchrist and Soames. Um, he steps in uh, to kind of help guide Mister Gilchrist and you know clear his conscience and everything, and uh, serves in a capacity that his father would have served. Uh, so it's a very very visual, very vivid kind of mentoring thing. Even though it meant that um, Gilchrist withdrew from school and. Um, went down to become part of the Rhodesian police force. Where undoubtedly he met with considerable success. One would hope. Yes. One would hope. Well, I can't think of too many other mentors, but if uh, our listeners happen to think of any examples, we would encourage you to write us at trifles at IHearOfSherlock.com or uh, simply drop a comment in on the show notes on our website for this at SherlockHolmesPodcast.com and um, next time we'll be back with another one of these episodes that is just a trifle. It is of course a trifle but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Well, Mr. Holmes, there's no denying that you have been of use to the Force once or twice in the past.